First of all, does anybody know the Slack desktop app? That still makes me so giddy. Uh, we just celebrated our fourth birthday. So, uh, you know, whenever I go anywhere, um, far out in the world, and people have seen my app, I'm like pretty happy about it. That makes me feel good. Anyway, uh, real quick, um, Slack's mission isn't necessarily to build a chat app. Our main mission is to make people's working lives, you know, generally simpler and more pleasant. And one of the areas we try to do that in is not just, um, you know, for our customers, but also for our developers. And in case you haven't seen it, this is what the app looks like. Um, and we essentially built one cross-platform application for all three platforms. Um, I'm going to explain a little bit about you know, what platforms actually mean for us. But um, throughout this whole talk, I want you to remember that our whole team currently has about four people um, for all desktop applications, um, which is sort of going to be the key point I'm going to be coming back to. Um, but let's talk a little bit about platforms. I myself I'm used to work at Microsoft. I'm traditional native, uh, native desktop applications guy. I used to write a lot of C Sharp, C++. Um, and let's talk a little bit about what kind of platforms we have out there today. Because you might think that it's just these three, right? That's like the default. People think, all right, I got Linux, Mac OS, Windows. How hard can that be? Um, let's start with Windows. Obviously, we have Windows 10. That might be the Windows system that you would use today, uh, which supports traditional Win32 applications, and usually a few uh, modern Windows 10 APIs. Then we have the Windows Store, which is a completely different beast, um, has very little to do with Win32. If you build a Windows Store app, that only runs on Windows 10 later, um, at least if you're using the Windows 10 SDK. Um, and whatever Win32 API you're used to doesn't really run in the Windows Store. So that's like a completely different platform. If you want to support that, it's like a different beast. And then, of course, we have Windows 7. Um, we are an enterprise application. We run at enterprises. And my reality is that tomorrow I'm going to have more Windows 7 users than I have today. Windows 7 is still growing, which to me as a developer is kind of tragic. I always point out that Windows 7 was released the same year Apple announced that the text messaging app would support images. That was 10 years ago. Like emoji didn't exist yet. That was a really long time ago, and people are still buying Windows 7 machines. I don't know why, but it's happening. It's very sad. Um, on, app, on the macOS side, things are a little bit easier. We have macOS 10, um, and you really don't need to support anything else, um, mostly because in the Apple world, if you don't have a notebook that was released in the last two years, you're basically a peasant and don't deserve anything good. That's the rule. Um, Apple is just going to kick you out immediately um, once your device is just slightly out of date. But they also have a store, and the store also works kind of different. It has a sandbox, a little different, different APIs. And then we have Linux, which just a mess. Let's just you know call it right there. Building desktop apps for Linux is really really hard because you don't really know what kind of libraries a computer even has, or whether or not you can display pixels, right? Like does Linux even have colors? Who knows? Depends on the distro, right? Good luck. Um, so that's that's where we enter the whole JavaScript world. And whenever I start talking about JavaScript apps, especially when I say that I want to build desktop apps in JavaScript, um, people usually are not very excited. Clearly, some people are here, but you know on both ends of the spectrum, both both in the web developers camp as well as in the desktop developers camp, people are like, eh, do I like this idea? Um, and what I always like to say is that you're probably already running JavaScript apps on the desktop and probably plenty of them. And it's a little bit like CGI. Um, you only notice it when it's bad. Um, there's tons of apps that use JavaScript that you're probably not aware of. My two go-to examples are the Adobe Creative Suite. If you use Photoshop or anything else, you're running Node.js. Um, the whole add-on ecosystem runs in Node.js. That's JavaScript. Um, if you're using NVIDIA drivers on Windows, there's like, a, like an innocent little EXE in the NVIDIA drivers called the NVIDIA Web Helper. That's just Node.js. Um, so if you have an NVIDIA driver on your machine right now and you're running Windows, you probably have Node.js on your machine too. Um, and then, of course, we have like this really long tail of applications. Um, Slack, we already talked about, but obviously Visual Studio Code, Atom, Git Kraken, the GitHub desktop app, all those applications are built entirely in JavaScript. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the framework that is behind all of those applications. <laughs> Electron. Um, that's what we're going to talk about today. I'm just going to briefly explain what Electron actually is, and then we're going to go and jump into a little demo. Um, at its very core, Electron has three pieces. Um, the first one is Node.js, the second one is Chromium, and the third one is C++. So Node.js um, 
is something that I assume at a JavaScript conference most people know, right? Node.js is one of the most popular developer ecosystems out there. It is the biggest open source ecosystem out there. If you have any developer product, you likely have a thing on NPM. If you have a database, there's likely a thing on NPM that allows you to connect to it. Quite powerful. The second piece is Chromium. Um, Chromium, especially libchromium content, which is the little rendering engine inside Electron, is, in my opinion, one of the most impressive cross-platform applications that ever existed. Um, if you just think about all the things that the web needs to support today, we have complex 3D animations, we have you know, the playback of video files, um, and it does so on Windows, Mac OS, and Linux reliably across platforms, and more importantly, it takes your pixels and displays them the same way across platforms, which is extremely impressive. And every single time somebody comes to me and is like, oh, Slack, easy peasy, I could just build that as a native app. I'm like, good luck in, you know, embedding YouTube apps on Linux. Like that alone right there, that's just like that little teeny tiny slice of you know, playing back a YouTube video on Linux. It's something that will probably take you months um, just because the codec support by itself is so tough to write, right? Um, and then the very last part is C++. Um, there's a really thick layer of C++ around Electron. We have written a bunch of APIs that you can use that expose common operating system features. But more importantly, you can use C++ yourself. Um, usually people aren't super interested in that, but it's like an important escape hatch that whenever you feel like you've hit the boundaries of what JavaScript can do for you, you can just write C++. Again, people don't really use that all that much, but we at Slack, for instance, use C++ quite a bit because whenever we feel like we've you know, hit the performance boundaries of what JavaScript can do, we can just go native and do it natively like we would in any other application. Um, so, Electron, what does it look like? Um, sorry, this is the most boring slide, and I always feel like bad when I show this slide because it's so boring, but bear with me, it's the only boring slide I have. Electron, when it starts, it's an invisible process. Um, you're going to do this just to like, set the base layer a little bit because web developers like us, we're not really used to the idea of multiple processes, so I'm going to talk about a multi-process architecture. When you start Electron, you're basically just starting a node process, um, and this node process is capable of opening up additional windows. Right? This is like a really traditional thing in any, <laughs> pretty much any desktop application, eventually you want to open up a window. And the cool part and the big difference here to a normal web application is that your two processes can talk to each other. So you have this one Node.js main process and you have like a window and those two things can now communicate. And of course, naturally, you can now open up multiple windows and all those windows can communicate with each other. Um, that's pretty cool. Uh, the default application to, you know, talk about here is Visual Studio Code, where every single extension you have run it, runs in its own invisible window just to ensure performance. Um, having multiple processes at your disposal is pretty cool. Um, we in the web were quite excited about web workers for a while now, but this is sort of like the same concept, but super sharp. You have multiple processes, and they can do all kinds of things. So in the case of Slack, um, we're not using Angular, we're using React, but we're otherwise very close to the normal you know, Angular code base. Uh, we have a lot of RxJS, a lot of observables. Um, the whole app is entirely written in ty TypeScript. And then we have like this one giant C++ piece up there. Um, and that, for us, is pretty much anything the application does that touches the operating system. We have a whole bunch of things that you, know, you really can't do just with web technologies. We have screen sharing. Uh, screen sharing supports multiple mouse cursors. That's really something you can't really do with CSS, right? You've got to like, go and hit C++ for that stuff. Um, and video calls, too, we do completely native just because we can. Um, and that's, that's, for us, a really interesting scenario where we build 99% of the application in JavaScript, CSS, and HTML. That is cross-platform. We can use web developers for that. And then for the last percent, basically the last mile where we need native code, we can just use native code. So. With that said, uh, we're just 10 minutes in. That's good. Um, because I want to go and jump straight into code. Uh, because I feel like all these slides don't really, don't really show what that actually means. Um, so let's jump over here. What you're seeing here is um, basically the default output from uh, Angular CLI. If you make a new app, Angular CLI, that's what your application looks like. I'm sure most of you have seen that. What I want to do now is I want to turn this little application that we have right here and turn that into um, a little code editor, very much like Visual Studio Code right here. Um, and we're also going to talk a little bit about you know, how you turn an application actually into a desktop application. So Visual Studio Code, for those of you who don't know, 
um, was actually never meant to be uh, was never meant to be a desktop application. Um, it all started with this little Monaco editor, which looks like this. <sighs> and then people at Microsoft were like, "What if we just packaged that up as a desktop application and gave it to people? It would be almost like Visual Studio Code, but way lighter." And then you know. That was basically a joke that got out of control, and now we have Visual Studio Code. That's the whole story behind it. Somebody was like, yeah, I mean, I think you're joking, but we should actually do that. Um, so here we are. Um, and we can just follow the same process. We can also take this little like web component here and turn that into a proper desktop application. So let's look at, uh, let's look at our stuff here. Um, for those of you who don't use Visual Studio Code, real quick, in the middle, obviously, we see our code. On the left, obviously, we see our files. And on the bottom here, that's my little terminal, right? That's just bash right now. So um, the normal thing I would do is I would just write npm start or npm run start. And that would start the Angular CLI. And Angular CLI would eventually serve my output after building it, right? That's like a the pretty default thing that would happen here. Um, and currently, Angular is using Node to display all that stuff. And eventually, it's going to use a browser to show it to me. So if I just check this out right here, right, that's now the default application. Kind of boring. So let's go back here and turn this into an uh, Electron app. The first thing we're going to do is we're going to define um, a new task. We're going to say Electron right here. And it's going to be easy enough. We'll just say launch this with Electron. And Electron being completely plugged into the Node ecosystem, you can just install it with NPM. I can just say NPM I Electron dash dash save. And that installs Electron. And the moment I install Electron, all this Angular stuff I have here is going to run in a Node context. Um, given that it's TypeScript, I probably also want Node types. So I'm going to install those too. There we go. And now we can start thinking about how we actually want to run this. So um, our application has a package.json, but it's missing one crucial thing. It's using, missing the main script, which is a pretty default thing in any and all Node applications. We currently don't have it. Um, it's the main entry point. So if you just say, Node, please launch this application with a package.json, it would look at the package.json, would try to find the main script and execute that. So I'm just going to call that main.js right here. There we go. Um, and I'm just going to make one of those main.js files. Here we are. Um, and if I just say console log hi, um, the thing that you would expect to happen is actually already happening. So if I just say npm run electron, we start that file. That file is now executing. It's essentially a normal node file, but with one important difference, and that is that we have the electron module available. So in Node, normally you already have FS and child process and whatever else you might need. We also have the electron module available. So I'm going to use that. I'm going to say const equals require electron. There we go. And I'm going to use two of the modules that Electron makes available. There's obviously tons of them, and I'm only going to use those two, but you know, it's going to get the concept across. The first one is app, and the second one is browser window. Um, they kind of explain themselves, but basically the app, that is an object that manages the application lifecycle, things like starting the app, shutting down the app, the operating system trying to open a file, all kinds of stuff. Um, and the only thing we care about right now is that the application is ready. And as soon as the application is ready, I'm just going to make a new window. Um, there we go. Easy enough. So now if I run this again, ta-da, we have our first browser window. Um, pretty straightforward. Obviously, now we need to open up the Angular application in there. What I'm going to do is I'm going to do two things. Um, I'm just going to build my Angular application. <sighs> and one important thing. Um, so you might already know the npm run build command for Angular, Angular CLI applications that just builds the application in production mode. One thing that I'm changing here is the base href. And I'm changing that because I don't intend to serve this application over the internet. I intend to serve it over the file system. Right? It's a desktop application. We shouldn't load stuff from the internet. I'm just going to load it locally. So I'm going to go and build that. And while I'm building that, I'm going to say main window, load URL. There we go, dist and index.html. We're going to try that again. Ta-da, here's our application. Um, so, so far, not super impressive, right? That's like 
pretty straightforward stuff. The one thing that truly sets this apart from just opening up your application in the browser is that in here, I have all of Node available. Right? I have the FS object available, and I can say FS equals require FS. Read dear sync. Let's just read the root folder. Why not? Right? And I can require native Node modules. In here, I can basically do anything I could do in a normal desktop application. I have full access to the operating system if I need it. So let's turn that into uh, an actual code editor. Um, easy enough, actually, because this Monaco editor that I was talking about is on NPM. Um, and given that I have a full node context, I don't really need anything like Webpack or anything. I can just call require my NPM module. It's kind of easy enough. So I'm going to go back to my editor here. I'm going to say npm i save Monaco loader. And we're going to start working on our component. So we got this component. We don't really need any other stuff. I'm just going to delete all of this. The only thing we really need is a div that is called container. That's where I'm going to put my um, that's where I'm going to put my editor in. And then the other thing I need is I need a little bit of style. Um, let's look at the style. Um, you might be able to tell that the app I'm building here is very bare bones, <laughs> extremely bare bones, but it's good enough. Um, one thing I want to call out is this thing right here, right? the viewport height. Um, if you're building an application today, a normal web application, you might have trouble actually using any of those modern things. right? You would need a transpiler. I don't really care about a transpiler because I know exactly which web rendering engine I'm using. If you're using Slack and you happen to sit in a completely locked down IT environment that, for whatever reason, needs to use IE8, I don't care because I'm shipping my own rendering engine. I can still use normal JavaScript. I can still use stuff that was invented, you know, in this decade. I'm not locked to whatever JavaScript we had in 2005. So anyway, um, that's my styles file. And now in the actual component here, in the constructor, I can start using Node, right? I can say const loader equals require Monaco loader, and that require right now is just the normal node require, or anything else you can do in node. I'm going to repeat that sentence many, many times. Um, so let's just turn that into, let's just, actually, let me just do this a little easier. Yeah. Just going to load Monaco. And you don't really have to worry about the Monaco details here. That's just a library. You replace it with whatever whatever library you would normally like, right? I'm going to go ahead and make ourselves a little editor. So um, what's happening here, real quick, um, this is not really about Electron. This is just about me creating this UI object. It could be anything else. Whatever UI library you use, you can use it here too. So in my case, I'm just creating a new monitor editor. I'm telling the Monaco library, hey, use this diff right here, the container diff. And if I didn't mess this up, we should now be able to use our little, oh, right, I obviously need to build first. So if I didn't mess this up, uh, we should actually have an editor right now. I did mess it up. Um, OK, fine. Sometimes TypeScript can be mean. OK. perfectly acceptable that Angular didn't fully understand what I'm doing here, because we are mushing Node and the normal Chrome environment together, which is a little mean, but it's going to work. OK, so npm run Electron, which does the same thing. And here we are in an editor environment that looks and feels a lot like the one we already have. I can just copy all this code right here, paste it in, and ta-da, just like that, I have my very own, my very own editor. Um, including all of uh, autocomplete, right? That was easy enough. That took us about 10 minutes. And now I can officially put build my own editor on my resume. Comes very good at interviews. And people ask you, so what do you use? And you're like, my own editor? Because, you know, the world didn't have enough. Um, uh, but obviously, we can take this like a lot further, right? Um, obviously, what we can do now, given that we have access to Node, we can read and save to the local file system. If you were to just use this as a web application, opening up a folder is really, really hard. Having an integrated terminal is really, really hard. You might be wondering how they actually built this terminal. They just used an NPM module, because why wouldn't you, right? Easy enough. Um, the Visual Studio Code team currently, um, it's a little bit bigger now. I think it has like 
12 people right now, but it's normally just five. And if I think back to like 2005, the, thing, uh, the things I would do with a five people team were a joke compared to what you can do now. Um, just because we have so much open source available online and uh, because all of this development is, is dramatically streamlined. Um, there's a few things I didn't touch upon. Um, I'm just gonna show you like a little trick right now. Cool stuff you can only do in the desktop world. Um, I can now decide that, you know, if you look at Visual Studio Code, they got this really cool gray bar here, um, and I don't, right? I got this like really boring browser Chrome. I'm changing stuff that they, it's really easy. I'm just saying, you know what? Different style. There we go. Now I got this like really cool window that is just black. The blackest of all the windows, right? All right, coolio. So. Um, that was the demonstration, that was the demo. Uh, I know we only wrote like 10 lines of code, but just to reiterate, if you feel like you didn't see the thing you meant to see, just use whatever you would do in Node and it's gonna work here, which is really neat. Um, so let's just, let's just jump back here real quick. Um, this is an important point. Uh, yeah, we sadly don't have like too much time to actually talk about it, but um, Node has this concept of native node modules, and native node modules are really, really straightforward. Uh, they basically are just C, C++, or any C lang. Um, if you're on macOS, you can even use Objective C, and they have full access to whatever you would do normally, right? Um, and then you create JavaScript bindings and expose those. Um, that might sound really scary, and it's really only useful for a small number of developers, at least it was in the past. The main audience for that were uh, Node.js developers that had performance constraints, right? Um, most typical applications would have been something like SAS, if anybody remembers SAS. Um, if you ever did like an NPM install SAS back in the day, you may have seen like a compiler flyby on your terminal. Um, that was the case because SAS is still a native application, except for Node SAS. But generally speaking, there's a lot of native code out of Node. Um, and whoever wrote it decided that it would be easier to do it in C than to do it in JavaScript. It would certainly be faster. And if you want to do anything like that yourself, you can do that in Electron. So every now and then I hit this like weird little corner code where somebody at Slack is like, oh, all right, I want this like one feature. And I'm, okay, I don't really have that feature available on the web, but fine, I'm gonna go look for it and I'm gonna go out and find it somewhere. It's like this really weird thing on Windows 7, which drives me nuts, but for whatever reason, Windows has this rule that in the first hour of using it, you shouldn't show a notification to the user because if you don't wanna scare them away, this might be their first computer. I'm not joking, that is real. Um, so how do you figure that out, right? You gotta like, huh? you gotta do COM, of course, because Windows 7 and we're living in 2005. COM is really hard. So let's do the registry instead. There's like a registry key. Again, how do you read a registry key? Right, it's a website, it's kind of hard. Um, in C, it's shockingly easy. So I'm just gonna show you something. It's called Windows Quiet Hours. Um, I'm just gonna show you what a native note module looks like. <laughs> it's shockingly easy, right? So in here, that's what a native note module looks like. I'm, I realize I'm at a JavaScript conference, but um, this could not be easier C. I, by the way, don't even know C. I literally I copy and pasted this together until it compiled. It works, it's fast. All it does is it reads the registry key um, and uh, V8, the JavaScript engine behind Chrome makes it really, really easy to turn this result and turn it into JavaScript. So the actual JavaScript behind it looks like this. Easy enough, right? It just calls the native function um, and that is now my native node module. And every single time you run Slack on a Windows computer, if you're on Windows 7, whenever you receive a notification, I will quickly call this method, which takes less than a millisecond because I wrote it in C. It's extremely fast and performant. That checks whether or not you have quiet hours enabled. Makes it pretty straightforward. That's also the same thing, for instance, that will keep notifications from showing up when you're giving a presentation, right? Um, and we wrote the same thing, uh, something very similar. Um, something very similar for a Mac OS because after all, we are a cross-platform application, right? So there's like the notification state on Mac OS 2. Um, and on Mac OS, I wanna use whatever we will currently use if I actually built a native Mac OS application, so I'm using application services. Again, this is code straight from the Apple, you know, doc documentation because 
God knows how Objective-C actually works. I certainly don't. I never wrote an Objective-C app. I have no intention of doing so. But whenever I hit anything where I can't really like use my JavaScript, I can go ahead and uh, start using this stuff. All right. So just like that, we're basically out of time. So let me summarize um, real quick. Building JavaScript apps on the desktop is uh, pretty amazing, and I heavily recommend that anybody who's interested should try it out. Um, I normally always point out here that when you have performance constraints or you have performance concerns, the main reason for you to like mess up performance is because web developers did something bad. And this, by the way, does not exclude Slack. I realize that we're currently probably using more memory than we should, and we're also most certainly using more memory than we could. And this is the most important point. Um, I assume we're all web developers here. I work obviously with a lot of web developers and my team, um, and every single time we, we include a new web developer at Slack, I always ask them the same question. I'm going to ask it here too. When was the last time you considered the battery impact of your JavaScript? Never. That's, that's when it was the last time. You never consider it. Of course, it has one, right? Um, and desktop developers are just a little bit more used to optimizing the code for stuff that web developers aren't used to. And the core point is that if you feel like Visual Studio Code uh, is performant enough, and by the way, it most certainly is. It's extremely fast. It opens in less than a millisecond. Um, it preloads JavaScript. It's pre-compiled. It's basically assembly at the moment you launch it. Um, it just means that you did something wrong, which is hard and tough. But whenever you make technology very, very easy, sooner or later, you're going to hit and run a bunch of code that isn't very good. right? And uh, in my case, that included just scanning my node modules. Um, <laughs> There's the library. There's a library called is online. Um, it's on Node, on NPM, uh, and it just checks whether or not your computer is online. But it does so by loading a 10 megabyte JSON file that contains a bunch of URLs, thousands of them. Doesn't need to. Loading 10 megabytes of JSON is unnecessary. Whether you want to check, you know, if you have internet. Um, but there's a lot of code that we just require and hope that it's decent. Um, I guess the same is true for all of us, right? Um, if you want to build a really performant application, sooner or later we'll start reading source code, including the stuff that you use. Uh, we now have more than 2,000 Electron modules available for stuff that I just showed. Um, so in the beginning of time, when we started working on Electron, there was a lot of stuff that just wasn't available yet, at least not as native code. Um, and those gaps have now been filled in. So if you want to send notifications now, if you want to reach the notification state, right, you wouldn't have to do that yourself. You can just use one of my modules or one of the other 2,000 modules. Um, there's a lot of them. And then lastly, um, there's all kinds of starter kits. Um, there's an Angular Electron starter kit. Um, there's Electron Forge. There's Electron Builder. I would recommend Electron Forge. It's basically Angular CLI, but for Electron apps, it sort of depends on how you look at it. Right? Do you want to build an Electron app in Angular, or do you want to build an Angular app that also runs as an Electron app? All kind of interesting stuff. Um, and that would be pretty much it. My last name is super complicated, so if you want to reach me, just go to this domain, and it will redirect you to my actual domain. Uh, I can also be <laughs> I'm, you know, we are all Euro Europeans here. Um, I'm German, moved to the United States, and it's tough, all right? Having a, la having a difficult last name is not easy. Um, Anyway, uh, so if you have any, any questions about Electron, please come and talk to me. Find me on Twitter. I'm pretty excited about it. And that will be it. Thank you very much.